Oil giant BP under renewed attack after a U.S. commission identified incredible failures at this and other companies implicated in the biggest oil leak in history. The inquiry found that the companies need top-to-bottom reform. But how will any reform prevent future oil spills? And what does it all mean for the offshore drilling industry? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. The Gulf of Mexico oil disaster was the result of a culture of complacency. That's the conclusion by the commission assigned to find out the reasons behind the Deepwater Horizon explosion that took place on April 20th this year. That conclusion came after a two-day hearing in Washington. The hearing included members from the three main companies involved in the oil spill. Here's John Terrett with more. Four men, three companies, BP, Transocean and Halliburton, some of their top executives under cross-examination by the BP Deepwater Horizon Commission's chief legal counsel. Mr. Ambrose, do you have a position on that? It was clear BP and Transocean couldn't agree on which company was responsible for carrying out a crucial pressure test that might have headed off the disaster. That test on the eve of the explosion showed nothing was wrong. You know, industry standard is that the operator will provide approval for negative tests. And the operator is BP. BP in this case. And for the first time, Halliburton contradicted BP and the commission on which route the scolding oil and gas took as it slammed into the rig prompting this from the BP representative. I could not follow the, the logic of his description. It was like a courtroom drama, the Commission's Fred Bartlett striding around and using props to set out his preliminary findings for the technical failures on Deepwater Horizon on the night of the disaster. At the bottom, this might be a 1,000 feet of cement. That's as high as a 100-story building. His findings include potentially faulty cement used to seal the well before drilling started in earnest, repeatedly misread pressure tests, which rig personnel incorrectly treated as a complete success. Well, either. Uh, that's simply a negative. And the Commission's co-chair identified several areas of his own that he thought had cost lives. Negative pressure test, the um, decision to replace the muds with, with seawater, judgments that appeared to have been wrong. The Commission also said it found no evidence so far to suggest anyone at BP, Transocean or Halliburton had compromised safety to save money, but it's promising to look further into possible cultures of corner cutting. The inquiry into what happened in the hours immediately before and after the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded in April continues in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday. The Commission's report is due to be completed by January. John Terrett, Al Jazeera, Washington. Well, joining us now to discuss this are our guests in London, Mamdouh Salame, an international oil economist and former consultant to the World Bank on oil and energy. In Exeter in the UK, David Santillo, a senior scientist and marine biologist at the Greenpeace Research Laboratory. And in London, Kevin Craig, managing director of PLMR, a political lobbying and media relations company. Thank you all for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Mamdouh Salame, was this mainly about data sharing and complacency? as the Commission put it, or is there a wider set of problems associated with deep-sea offshore drilling? Uh, first, initially after the disaster, all the blame in the United States was put on BP. Now at least we are getting some even-handedness from the American Commission to show that not only BP, but two other American companies who were subcontractors to BP, Halliburton, and Transocean were involved. I think in the final analysis, we will find that the three companies are to blame, and the blame will be apportioned according to them. Maybe BP will get a bigger uh, portion of the blame simply because it was the, the leading company there. However, whatever happens now, the future of uh, deep water exploration will continue and will flourish, albeit with higher safety measures, because the future of oil production is in the deep waters of the oceans and the seas. So let me turn to Kevin Craig. I mean, did this commission at the end of the day come up with any constructive solutions for the future of offshore drilling? Was one of the main problems, for example, the fact that this kind of drilling was allowed to take place for so long without 
first putting in place the kind of technology that would deal with contingency in case of an emergency. After all, this well was leaking for three months before it was capped. Well, this, uh, the latest findings from the Commission are most significant because at last they give uh, a bit of clarity as to who uh, was responsible and it wasn't just one company, it wasn't BP on their own and BP's problem was it was headed up by a Brit at a time when the White House were actively encouraging the American public to see this as a, a, a BP, a British Petroleum problem. So I think the Commission's findings are, are most significant because they moved the debate on from was this a case of safety being ignored for profit and it said no and they're secondly most significant because they clearly say there was more than one company responsible here and these findings are not good reading for any of the companies involved but they do say that there, are, there have been mistakes but they are very clear that it wasn't profit before safety but they are still nonetheless very critical of all three companies involved. Critical of, of all three companies but David Santillo was it also a result of the lack of oversight and, and accountability that oil companies are essentially not accountable to anyone. They're free to operate the way they want. Well, I think there is an element of the fact that because these companies uh, are operating in these sorts of uh, extreme conditions, uh, that the degree of oversight and accountability has not been uh, what it ought to be. I think the outcome from the Commission is certainly significant. It's beginning to uh, put down some detail on exactly what went wrong, and it seems to be a, a, a whole series of individual uh, problems that have built up uh, into what was, in the end, a, a catast catastrophe for uh, the loss of human life and for the environment. And I think the important thing uh, is that we see this in, in a broader context. I'm afraid I, I don't share the optimism that we should just assume uh, that from here on in these operations will be inherently safer. I don't think there's any way that you can guarantee uh, that this kind of chain of events or a, a, another chain of events uh, won't lead to a similar sort of event happening somewhere down the line if we continue to exploit offshore oil. Mamdou Salame, without the kind of accountability, without more rigid uh, rules of operation, will this kind of accident happen again in the future? And does it throw into light uh, the kind of almost incestuous relationship between politicians and the big oil corporations and the interests that are often at play? Well, in order to drill in deep water oceans, as you know, and seas, the technology must be extremely advanced. And we take it for granted that even with advanced technology, you cannot eliminate an element of risk. However, the lesson from the Gulf of Mexico disaster is that operations in the future, especially deep water drilling, will be under scrutiny and there will be liable to much higher standards of safety. But, but to but, eliminate but who, but who should be, who, who should be responsible for, for putting that in place? Should the U.S. government also shoulder a good degree of responsibility for allowing this kind of uh, drilling to go on without ensuring that the companies comply with the appropriate safety protocols? Both governments like the United States and the governments in, in, uh, in which rigs are exploring for oil in their territorial water should be responsible. The governments can uh, legislate higher standards and they must make sure that they monitor that these standards are adopted by the multinational oil companies and implemented to, the, to their best uh, effort. David Santillo, the damage to the marine life has been widely documented. We all remember seeing these images of, uh, of the wildlife covered in, uh, in, in so much oil. But beyond this immediate damage to the environment, to the ecological system, is there a long-term potential also that uh, there will be more of a damage uh, to come that will be uncovered in the future, given the fact that five million barrels of oil are believed to have uh, leaked into the ocean? Yes, that's certainly a very real potential, and I think that uh, with the, uh, the sort of work that's going ahead now on board ships uh, in the Gulf, looking at some of those less visible impacts of, of the oil, finding uh, evidence of the plume uh, at great distances away from the spill site, finding in the last few days uh, direct evidence of impacts on some of the deep water corals in that area. Uh, clearly, we don't know yet the uh, precise scale 
uh, of those long-term impacts. But uh, with an oil spill of this nature uh, into the marine environment, uh, that, that's always a, a very real possibility. And it would be unwise, I think, to uh, draw uh, conclusions too early that somehow the oil had, uh, had disappeared, simply because we're not seeing the most visible uh, impacts of oiling. The, the toxic impacts of the oil could well uh, continue well into the future. Uh, Kevin Craig, what could still be the regional and international ramifications then? I mean, oil spills don't stop at border. The, the, you know, in this case, seemingly the current had flushed most of the oil to the Louisiana coast, but it could have easily gone toward countries like Mexico. What would have happened then? What kind of compensation would these countries that it might have been affected have had? Well, look, look at where this story is going next. The committee uh, carries on with its work. Litigation on a very large scale has commenced. The American public, uh, they like their oil. They want security of energy supply, but they also want it to be done, to be done safely. And they are, they're, they are going to be very demanding in asking the sorts of questions that the other two guests today have talked about in terms of future safety of supply. And they're also going to ask that, you know, lives are not lost again. Now, no guarantees can be given, but they have got some very, very strong questions to be asked. They're not going to allow the Obama presidency to do what they've done so far, which is to uh, deflect discussion onto one company. And in due course, once the experts keep giving us more information about the environmental ramifications of the spill, concerns held by the general public may spread to other countries beyond the US, where people are still very, very angry albeit they were slightly sated by the uh, departure of Tony Hayward from BP and the installation of American Voice at the top of the company. But this issue is not finished yet, uh, just a new discussion, a new front has opened. So, so Mamdou Salami then, if this spill had affected countries like Mexico or Cuba, what recourse would they have had? Can they claim under the current legislation the convention, uh, the law of the sea convention that the US isn't party to incidentally, any kind of compensation? Well, of course, they would have claimed compensation if the, uh, the uh, pollution has reached their shores. But um, uh, luckily, it didn't. However, but what there is a the limit future? how much you can... Well, for the future, any country whose shores have been affected and the environment can make a claim, but the claim has to be reasonable. But before we talk about claims, we have to make sure that countries who, who's, uh, where there is deep water exploration in their territorial waters have to be very careful in implementing the highest levels of security and safety. And in this way, we can uh, try to avoid to a great extent any accidents like that and of course in that case the uh, claims issue will not be uh, will not arise uh, Kevin Craig in this case uh, BP was very quickly accused by everyone including of course the the US government first and foremost as uh, as the main prime suspect after all it was operating this oil rig at the time of the explosion but if this spill had affected uh, a smaller company what would have happened who would have been held liable financially if it were a company that didn't have the financial means to undergo the mm. uh, the kind of compensation and clean up and damage related costs that bp was able to well act actually uh whilst at the core of this is the loss of human life and the environmental disaster it was probably uh, fortunate uh, to a degree that a company of this size was involved because it could afford the massive cleanup operation, it could afford to resource the um, compensation that will inevitably be necessary. A smaller company would probably have gone under financially and would not have been able to survive. Um, it is only the larger companies that can actually come through this sort of episode and they, uh, BP, who do, I'm not an apologist for them, but they do invest a lot in safety. They they are not coming out of this well. There are massive lessons to learn. But a smaller company would not have sustained this sort of incident. Um, and but, but, I hope that the families of those involved are, are compensated. But did BP invest enough in safety in this case? Or did they cut corners? Well, it's, that's, that's what the, the Commission is looking at. And, and the most significant events of the past week, I think, from, a, from a, 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 a general public in America and beyond point of view and the reputation of those involved, are that the Commission has, has said 
clearly that safety was not uh, compromised for profit, albeit there are big problems to address. And Tony Hayward, the former CEO himself, has acknowledged that as a global CEO, the way in which he, he talked to the American public uh, was not what it should have been. He said that himself this week. So I think, um, in answer to your question though, there is a clear steer from the Commission that safety was not put before profit. But does that mean that everyone who cares about the environment and global reputations and the lives of those lost can be happy? No, it doesn't, because this is a disaster. Uh, Tony Hayward, blamed by many for not uh, saying the right things in the wake of this disaster, recently made a few comments uh, in an interview and said, incidentally, that um, he might have done better had he had a degree in, in acting and not in geology. But, but let me turn to David Santillo and ask whether BP is in a category of its own when it comes to recklessness and to not adhering strictly to safety standards. Or do other companies, uh, major companies like Exxon, like Shell, do they also fall in this, into the same category? Well, as you know, it's, it's very hard to tell. There are certainly uh, numerous accidents and, and incidents that have occurred uh, involving companies uh, other than, than BP. Uh, and I think that this is uh, really where the, where the problem lies. I mean, whether or not the Commission uh, decides in the end that, uh, that, that profit was put before uh, safety, clearly safety was compromised. Uh, and I think that we have to keep in mind that up until the Deepwater Horizon spill, uh, we were asked to, uh, to believe uh, that the highest safety standards were being applied by BP and by all other oil companies. It's only when this sort of incident happens that you get something going wrong uh, of this magnitude that you realize that those sorts of reassurances are never a guarantee against failures of, uh, of, of equipment, against human errors, uh, against this sort of uh, l chain of events which can lead to, uh, to a massive blowout. And those kinds of things uh, unfortunately won't be prevented uh, further in the future simply by renewing calls for, for greater uh, focus on safety. In the end, if we truly want security of energy supply. The answer doesn't rely, uh, doesn't do, uh, uh, lie in uh, drilling in ever more extreme, more offshore environments. It depends on developing renewable uh, sources of energy, on improving energy efficiency. That's where the real security of energy supply will, will be. Mamdou Salami, what might seem a little astonishing is that in spite of all of this, the massive uh, disaster that this has caused, a federal judge in the United States ordered that the six-month moratorium that the Obama administration had put in place, uh, banning offshore deep sea water drilling, uh, ordered it to be lifted, saying that um, it made absolutely no sense, it was incomprehensible. Uh, do you agree with that kind of ruling? And did the government fail to make a case that if this happened with BP, it could happen with any company in the future? The United States looks at the security of supply of oil. The Gulf of Mexico provides almost 2 million barrels a day to the United States out of 5.5 million barrels a day of production. So it is very important for the United States that it continues or that deep water exploration continues in the Gulf of Mexico and in a wider scale around the world because that's how you can prevent the price of oil from rocketing and the price of oil is already heading upward but, so but is you, that really a valid is, is, is that a valid argument though because the energy information administration that's the EIA which is a part of the U.S. Department of Energy, found that access to the Pacific, to the Atlantic, and to eastern parts of the Gulf of Mexico would increase domestic oil production by just 1.6 percent between 2012 and 2030. This will have very little impact, if any at all, on the price of oil, won't it? And on oil production as well. Uh, no. No, I disagree because, as I am saying, it is the future of oil production in the world and in the Gulf of Mexico to keep exploring in deep water. Otherwise, the price of oil will shoot. Of course, most of the oil of the world onshore has been discovered. The only future for oil production is in deep water. And of course, if you add safety to that, you increase the cost of production. But the price of oil is already heading upward without exploration in deep waters of the oceans and the seas, we will see an oil crunch very close by. And I myself, from my research, find that by the year 2012, there will be no 
production capacity in the world. And by 2015, the deficit between supply and demand would be around 10 million barrels a day. This will be reflected in higher oil prices, matching, if not exceeding, the price reached in July 2008, which is $147 a barrel. Okay, That's Kevin why Craig. it's very important. Kevin Craig, then, is this, is this an overly alarmist uh, point of view, or do you also subscribe to it? Well, I think uh, the, uh, after you get through the, the immediate aftermath of the tragedy that, that has taken place off the coast of America, um, you, you do then uh, have to turn to the discussion about the fact that the long-term energy demands of the world, with the de developing economies of uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, there is a massive problem coming our way. Now, this is not going to happen, in, in, in my view, as, a, as someone who reads consumer opinion in the next five to ten years, but there is going to come a crisis point where the the demands the lifestyles across the globe with in, increased affluence are not going to be met by the current uh, energy infrastructure and I don't think anybody commentating on this issue in the world today has the answer but it, in the short term the American public are in love with the the motor car so are uh, increasing amounts of consumers in developing economies and we have got I think all of us would agree a massive problem coming our way well and now with the research and Republicans in both houses of Congress. What chances, David Santillo, uh, do we have of seeing any kinds of uh, limits placed on this kind of offshore drilling in the future, even if it means that it might endanger the environment? It's really hard to tell uh, whether the, uh, the concept now of uh, uh, looking again uh, at whether deep water drilling has to be part of the, the future uh, will we'll now slip uh, off the agenda. There has been the feeling over the past six months uh, within the industry and I think within uh, government circles in the US and elsewhere uh, that it's merely a matter of waiting for the dust to settle uh, and then things can continue with business as usual. Uh, I think what we have to realize is that we cannot uh, continue with business as usual uh, even in the absence of future uh, oil spills of, of this nature. Uh, we cannot simply keep chasing more and more oil uh, because of the damage that it will do to the climate, uh, to the oceans through uh, acidification as a result of the, uh, the CO2 that's released. We have to find uh, an alternative track for our future uh, energy use uh, and uh, for our future uh, economic and, and, uh, and societal development. And I think that unless we use uh, this opportunity to begin to face up to the, some of those realities, uh, we really will have, uh, have lost an opportunity uh, politically and socially to uh, begin to tackle uh, some of those more global problems. Mamdou Salami, just uh, finally, if I can have your thoughts on this, should this oil spill at the very least uh, uh, help craft new regional standards for the exploration of gas and oil? Of course, that is a must. If we are going to avoid disasters like that, the, there must be the countries and oil companies should implement much higher safety measures. Otherwise, we, with advanced technology, we are going to encounter the risk of similar disasters. But I hope if we implement higher standards, although it will raise the price of oil and the cost of production, but at least safety is far better than having disasters like that, which is costly to countries and to oil companies, as we as evidenced by the financial troubles which faced BP after the disaster. Mamdou Salame, David Santillo, and Kevin Craig, thank you all very much for joining us. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. You can send us your comments and suggestions by emailing them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. From all the team here, thanks for watching.